So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't go on for too long um, because this is this is still not I would say the most important uh, module. I mean, we're still not getting into the interlingual part. Um, so this is module two A on interlingual re-speaking, um, which you can find there in the map in the course. Uh, course structure. So it's the first of the core components. Um, when I'm saying it's not important, it is obviously important because it's a core component, but it's still dealing with the interlingual process of re-speaking. So that will be for ECTS, for credits, um, before we move on to interlingual re-speaking. Um, we do believe, uh, and, and, and as shown by some of the research that, for example, Haley Dawson has conducted, we do believe that this kind of first bit is on intralingual re-speaking is, is quite important. Um, and indeed, some of the intralingual re-speakers who have um, been trained as interlingual re-speakers have, have benefited from, from their background uh, enormously. So here we are with 2A, the first of the, four of the, of the two core components. Um, for this module, we have a similar structure starting with the teacher's guide. So even though, as we said, the course is not monitored, then there is um, there are some guidelines as to how to teach it. Um, we're going for four different units. The first one, it's um, aiming to, in a way, position our tasks within the overall map of live titling or live subtitling and re-speaking. So then we move on to speech recognition and dictation. And then we have initial intralingual re-speaking and advanced intralingual re-speaking. Um, for unit one, uh, and I'll show you some of the components, of it, you can have a, an idea of, of what the rest will be made up of as well. Uh, what we've done is we have a welcome word, as the rest of the modules do, video lectures. In this case, they're a bit uh, longer, I think. Um, yeah, I, would, I just wasn't able to, to make them shorter. We have relevant resources and exercises. And like I said, here we uh, we have made a bit of an effort to show, in the case of, of this first unit, we have made a bit of an effort to show uh, a non just a Eurocentric way of showing uh, life titling and re-speaking, but to tell uh, what's been done in America, um, in Australia. So in the relevant resources, um, I think for this particular module at least, that's probably the most important part. Um, and this is something that we have taken into account. The video lectures are obviously there and, and they've been filmed and it's a bit more difficult to change them. So we've tried to provide a bit of a timeless content, as timeless as it can be with 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 something as changing as, as, as these disciplines that we're dealing with. But for the relevant resources, um, I still I can still see how they may be updated every now and then with new material the material that we have provided here are examples. All these are links, obviously. Examples about, for example, in the case of life titling methods or life titling methods um, uh, about how this is being done in Australia and Canada and the UK or France. And then particularly with regard to speaking, we're also showing it, um, showing how it's been done in different countries. So you may have from, uh, you know, videos and pictures of stenotypists, for example, here in Australia or a re-speaker in Canada or voice writer as they call them in America. So we, we give a bit of a taste about how um, all these methods are being applied in different countries, the terminology that is being used. As you can see, different ways to get to the same place as we have often said in the case of intralingual re-speaking, the end product that is same language subtitles for in this case a life program are what everyone needs to get uh, to obtain but different countries are, di are going about it in a different way so in France for example you have a four people set up with um, I don't know if you can see my uh, mouse hovering on the screen but two re-speakers on the left two female re-speakers then there will be a corrector here that's the, the third woman here. And that man would be um, a whisperer. So in this case, it's whispering potential corrections to the corrector. So uh, the corrector can implement them. And all this happens before the subtitles are being broadcast for the viewers, which means that um, a great deal of attention is paid to decreasing the amount of recognition errors, that is increasing 
the accuracy of the recognition to the detriment of delay. Whereas other countries um, perhaps prioritize delay by having only one re-speaker who re-speaks the subtitles are being broadcast and then the corrections are being done free speaker themselves um, after the event once the subtitles are, have been broadcast. So we've tried to cater for um, the different types of setups that we have found and not just um, res uh, kind of deal with only one. Um, as part of these relevant resources, we have also conducted interviews. You will have seen this. Um, this is part of the intermedia conference we had in Poland not long ago in Warsaw. And in this case, we have interviewed Kristin Ailes, who is perhaps the leading uh, re-speaking trainer, voice writing trainer in the US. And um, we have kind of strengthened, in Ilsa, we have strengthened our collaboration with her. And we have made a bit of an effort to open up to how things are being done in, the, in America by joining what's known as the Global Alliance for Speech and Text Interpreting sorry, for speech-to-text captioning, um, and Christine is part of that. So we have interviewed her and she's shared with us how she goes about training voice writers in the US, which is very interesting because it's quite complementary to what we're doing, but it's not exactly the same. It's a slightly different approach from which we have learned at radio. So that's been very um, rewarding for us as well, and I hope the interviews are rewarding for our um, for whoever uses the the course, uh, as I think has been said, you can access the PowerPoint or the transcript of the video. Um, another resource that we have seen, uh, we've gathered some feedback on the course, as you will see in the presentation by Jesus Merino and Haley Dawson later. But some of the best rated resources are those that show students from previous years doing some re-speaking exercises. So in this case, you will be able to see how this TED Talk is being re-spoken from English into English by one of our, if I'm not mistaken, New Vigo students. Um, so you can hear the re-speakers speaking, you can see the words as they're being displayed on screen, So, and you can hear the original voice. So it's, it's enough to be able to see um, how the re-speaking is going, where the errors are um, may, may, be, may be happening, whether it's recognition because of issues with dictation or whether it's mostly addition because it's difficult to keep up with the speaker. And once um, students, our students going through these modules are seeing this, then they can follow up with the actual analysis with a NER model of how this student has performed. So that also helps to I would say from the very beginning, mostly or almost from the very beginning, start thinking about quality and quality assessment. Um, and always not from the point of view of words, but of ideas, which is what we're dealing with when we're talking about especially edition. So we try to build up the quality assessment issue from the beginning um, so that students are aware of, of how they're going to be assessed. And so that type of quality assessment is kind of built up in, as part of a training as well. Um, something else that we have that we're using here and that we have developed as part of the ILSA project is this um, score sheet, which was created by Luis Alonso from Uvigo and Franz Boschacker from the University of Vienna. And this was very useful for us to be able to uh, select the training material that we we're talking about mostly speeches and videos for re speaking, uh, but also for interpreting, but mostly here for re and interlingual, and we wanted to be able to classify them um, according to different levels. So uh, Luis and, and Franz have been very um, helpful in, in helping us find different parameters, whether to do with content, language, delivery, context, or some, some quality, that can then help us um, ascribe those videos to three different levels, basic, intermediate, and advanced. As you can see, content, language, delivery, and context have three levels each. So for every video, we would um, give a score um, from one to three here, content, language, delivery, context. And then, I don't know if you can see at the bottom, um, then depending on the score that you get, the video will be classified as basic, intermediate, or advanced. It's pretty much the three levels that we were dealing with. So that was very helpful. 
and um, as part of a publication that will should come up soon uh, in the translator interpreter uh, trainer journal. Nathalie Fresno and myself have tried to turn this into a bit of a proposal for scaffolded training as well, based on genres, because we we did have a lot of questions. Um, a lot of people have were asking us about the different genres and how that reflects on the different types of levels, learning outcomes, and exercises. So basically, we we use that uh, score sheet that I just showed you to uh, see how the three different levels could be trained according to the different genres as well. Uh, whether they have one or two people speaking, there's overlapping speech, there's a down, and that kind of thing. So this is a proposal that is out there as well, that we have published it, and uh, it, should be, it should be publicly available soon. Um, that's it. And then, of course, the exercises, they, they have different types of, um, I mean, students have different types of exercises that they can practice from quizzes like, like this one, uh, which are obviously part of the other models as well. Um, and then more practical uh, and more time-consuming exercises to do with actual re-speaking tasks, whether it's sports, as you can see here, which are followed by quality assessment, of course, or chat would be deemed as perhaps the most difficult um, type of video, the most difficult genre to re-speak. Um, and I think that's it, yeah. Uh, so if there are any questions about it, uh, please feel free to ask and I'll do my best to answer. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Pablo. I, s I can see that there are questions already in the chat box. Uh, you have to go up to Maria Jose. Can you explain in detail the four people set up in the pic you showed? So I don't quite understand why two speakers if it is interlingual and there is speech recognition in place. Can you see the question, Pablo? Um, I'm getting there now. Am I still sharing my screen or not anymore? Not anymore. Okay. Uh, let me just check. Can you explain it? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't quite understand why two free speakers if it's interlingual and there is, yeah. So normally, um, it's a shame that Sylvain Cachelan is not here because he was a bit, an advisor for us and he's a French free speaker, intralingual free speaker. Um, in France, free speaking is done with three or four people normally. Um, and this is part of the, of the kind of official guidelines, if you like, in France. So at the very least, you normally have, or I've seen setups with two people as well, but at the very least, you normally have a re-speaker, then you have the corrector, and in between that you have the um, whisperer, um, which is the person who whispers the potential corrections to the corrector, as I said. But often you'll have a second re-speaker. Now, that second re-speaker is meant to be helping the first re-speaker, uh, although I doubt that you can have somebody else telling you anything as you're re-speaking, there's enough multitasking going on, but effectively it, it can work w uh, as, a, as a way of having a shift, so basically you just replace the other re-speaker after 15-20 minutes and, and so it goes, they take turns. So that would happen for, actually, for actual intralingual re-speaking, which means there's more delay in the whole process, but there is uh, more accuracy too. So, as we often say, re-speaking is all about managing delay and accuracy. You can't do, most of the time, you can't do both at the same time, so it depends on what your priority is. You may or may not have more work before you broadcast the subtitles. Um, there is a, a, an answer by Daniela Ejaya, who will be part of the panel today. I think the two re-speakers, intralingual, speech to text interpreters, yes, are for turn-taking indeed, not for co-editing. Exactly, because the editors are the other two, the whisperer and the corrector. Um, and uh, Charlotte is saying, to add to Maria's point, Pablo, in your experience, how common is it for there to be a corrector editing another re-speaker before broadcast? Okay, how common is that? Um, it really depends on the setting and the country. So first, are we talking TV or live events? And second, what country? If we're talking TV, um, countries like Spain, the UK, for example, tend to have only one re-speaker because in those countries, um, well, they, they, they've just they, they've just not set it up for two re-speakers. And in the UK, for example, they wouldn't allow 
much delay. They want to decrease delay, therefore they want one re-speaker who re-speaks, everything is broadcast, and then if any corrections need to be made, they are done after the event and they are seen by all viewers. In other countries, they've managed to, well, they've, they've prioritized accuracy and they don't mind having as much delay, for example in France. And in other countries, in the, like Belgium for example, for some cases they've managed to, to include an antenna delay, which is some programs are broadcast as live, but they're not exactly live. They're meant to be live, but they have a bit of a delay there, and it's called an antenna delay. Um, so they're happening at four o'clock, but they're maybe broadcast at 30 seconds later or some minutes later. And that gap, that antenna delay, that gap is used by re-speakers, more than one, to be able to prepare the re-speakers sometime to synchronize them. So this is what happens on TV. We've tried to explain during the course uh, all the different tabs for the countries, different countries. And for live events, you often have more than one re-speaker as well. Again, it depends on the country. But Daniela, for example, she does work often with a co-editor who will edit her subtitles. Um, she'll tell us more about it. So it's it's horses for courses, really. It depends on, on where we are, what setting, what country, and what we're allowed to do and also what we prioritize, whether it's accuracy or the decrease of delay. Um, I, I'm trying to read it. Um, so, Aline Vermeil says, and the difficulty of the program? Yes, obviously the difficulty of the program is key. Uh, it's a key factor involved in the decision of whether you can go with one re-speaker only or you need a team. And we're talking only intralingual. For interlingual, obviously the preference is to have more than one person due to the complexity involved in the task as explained by France. There is another question there. Isabel, do you mind if I just read them out yet? Um, can you explain yes, please the difference? Do, please do. Can you explain the difference in function from speech recognition output and the role of the re-speakers? Um, I'm not sure I get this one. The re-speaker edit the. Yeah, I mean the 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 speech recognition output. Uh, let's just say the re-speaker listens to something, says it out in the same language or another. In this case, in the same language plus punctuation marks. So a good morning, ladies and gentlemen, would turn into good morning, comma, ladies and gentlemen, full stop. Then, if that comes out with um, errors, it will be. Uh, corrected either, either by the same re-speaker if it's on its own or by a co-editor working alongside. I think that's, I don't know whether that answers your question, Maria Jose. Uh, Gunter says that's right, Gunter. Part of the project is VRT, so public broadcaster in um, Flanders and Gunter uh, and his colleagues, they do have this antenna delay, depending on the programs, which allow them to prepare subtitles and uh, sometimes broadcast them w without errors and synchronized. The antenna, uh, this antenna delay is not allowed in every country. In the UK, we tried to introduce it, but for different reasons, uh, it was not it was it was not accepted. Um, Daniela says, when it's more than one hour, uh, we're talking intro. Where we're speaking here for over an hour or when the topics are difficult or dense then you do need a, a person working alongside you. This is a fascinating issue of the working conditions of intra and interlingual re-speakers which we will cover at length during the panel because it's happening now and we need to make important decisions about it. Um, Gunter says, and he's quite right, sometimes for example in VTM where Verle, who is part of a project works in Flanders, they have a re speaker per speaker. So three people talking in a program and you'll have different re-speakers who would just be ascribed to every speaker to cover every speaker. Um, and Maria Jose says, can you show again the Q&A sheet that you, uh, quality assessment sheet? Uh, yeah, um, let's see. Okay, in a second, Isabel, shall I show that? Yes, you have to share your presentation again and move to the slides. Uh, will do. Will do. I, as I do this, I don't have access to the chat. If there's any questions, you let me know. Okay, yes, I will do. So that, I would imagine we're referring to the score sheet. Um, Is it? 
Is it showing now, Isabel? Um, Hopefully yeah. now. Hopefully now. Okay. I don't know if, if yes, yes, is it, yes. I don't know if it was re referring to this. Uh, so I'm showing it now, um, and it's been useful for us to be able to classify the the videos and and decide, because all, all these issues are very important. Um, I would imagine in interpreting, but especially in respeaking, whether you're familiar with the subject, the it's, level of technicality. The previous slide. I'm sorry, Pablo. Okay, that was just going going on. Uh, this is it, I would imagine. This is the application of a NAM model or part of it. I wasn't able to fit everything in this slide. Okay, that one, yes. Mm -hmm. So this is just uh, the tech talk, the, uh, respoken for how long. These are the, the words that were imported by the re-speaker into the software because they were not part of software. The macros, that is the vocal uh, voice shortcuts, if you like, that you have to use to get these words right, which if you remember, in the workstation that I showed you at the beginning of the session, you could see all those post-it notes with macros that re-speakers use. And then at the bottom, you have the beginning of the, of the analysis, which will be um, divided in chunks and then idea units, and then we start looking at whether any information has been missed or whether any words have been misrecognized, and then I haven't told you here everything, but there's a calculation at the bottom where you have the NER score and an assessment. The NER score should reach 98% for it, for the exercise to be good enough, um, for the subtitles to be good, and uh, the assessment will tell you more about the delay and other aspects of the quality uh, of, of the exercise.